evening and welcome to the UP Community Health Town Hall series. My name is Elise Burr. I'm the director of the Northern Michigan University Center for Rural Health, and I'm hosting this evening's program, which has been organized in partnership with Dr. Kelly Cam, epidemiologist and assistant professor in the Department of Kinesiology and Integrative Physiology at Michigan Technological University. This evening's program will focus on nutrition and food security. And our panelists will be joining us right now. So this evening, uh, our guest panelists are uh, Dr. Kelly Cam. Uh, we also have Brett Peterson. Uh, Brett is a registered dietitian and operation manager at Northern Michigan University. He is also a clinical dietitian for Bell Hospital and consulting with Munising Memorial Hospital. Uh, we also have Joseph Jones. Uh, Joseph is the Director of Strategic Initiatives and Partnerships at Feeding America West Michigan. Uh, this evening, he will be talking about mobile food pantries and food insecurity in the Upper Peninsula. We also have tonight Jolene Spencer. Uh, she's joining us, a Public Health Nurse Coordinator from Marquette County Health Department. She will be talking about the WIC program. And Sue Kelpie, uh, Case coordinator and Michigan ACE master trainer for the Western UP Health Department. Uh, she will be talking about SNAP program and benefits. And lastly, we have Gary Perala, outreach coordinator for the UP Food is Medicine program, which has been around for a little bit here in the UP, and we look forward to hearing more about that this evening as well. So let's get started with Kelly Cam talking a little bit about statistics and what's happening with nutrition and food security in the UP. Kelly, take it away. Thanks, Elise. I'm glad to have everybody here tonight and welcome to all of our panelists. Um, so to give you guys a little bit of a start on uh, thinking about food and nutrition and food insecurity, um, globally, when we look from a huge picture, so nation, um, internationally, globally, we have about one in three people suffer from at least one form of malnutrition. And that malnutrition can be undernutrition, which is what we often typically think of, of malnutrition, and that's not enough energy or nutrients for growth and development. But it also includes overnutrition, which is a huge problem in the United States and in our local communities. Um, and micronutrient deficiencies. And any one of those three types of malnutrition can lead to all kinds of adverse health, health effects. Um, we're also, from a global perspective, we are right near the end of the UN Decade on Action for Nutrition, which ends um, in 2025. And it's working to address all forms of malnutrition in a sustainable way to provide um, food and nutrition for everybody in the world. And as we've all experienced with the costs of food going up lately, getting nutritious quality food can, can be difficult at times, not only the cost, but as we live here up in the UP, it's not exactly a lot of um, local foods available, um, on, you know, uh, fruits and vegetables in the wintertime. So sometimes availability or options for choice make it difficult as well as preferences, how much time it takes to cook, as well as our knowledge of what we should be eating. Um, and then the other thing we ask to think about is that many of our values are often tied with food when we often think about food and think about celebrations and culturally meaningful food, as well as making choices about our food and nutrition based on um, other things like maybe our, our environmental concerns or how food are, how far our food is transported. Um, and we can also think about our food in relation to our environment and many of us that garden or forage or, um, or hunt or fish or gather from our environment. When we look at the UP, so 73% of our adults are obese or overweight. Uh, it's a little bit more than the average across Michigan. And only 8.4% of adults report eating at least five servings of fruit and vegetables per day when asked about the previous seven days. Um, and that was from a survey that was asked in late, um, late summer, early fall, when we would have a lot of um, potential access to, to fruits and vegetables grown locally. Um, in Michigan, 40% of adults in Michigan, 45% of 9th through 12th graders report eating less than one fruit serving per day. It's a little bit better for vegetables, but not a whole lot. Um, and then when we look on the other end of things of really looking at food insecurity, so across the United States, about 10% of all households were food insecure, which means that they, at some point during the 2021, didn't have enough food or weren't sure where their food was coming from. In Michigan, we're a little bit higher at 11%. And I don't have the, the, the local numbers, um, so perhaps we can hear if Joseph has those local numbers, but the only thing I can find is statewide. 
Um, and so in Michigan, of those 11.4%, so um, a little bit more than half of those are actually people of very low food insecurity, which means that they're disrupting their food, their normal eating patterns or skipping meals because they don't have enough money or resources for food. Um, and it's worse in households that are low income. It's worse in rural areas. It's worse if you have kids. Um, and so if you have that interaction of all of those, it can be really difficult. Um, and um, one of the other things to think about is that the impact of the economic disruption from COVID was probably blunted because there were significant efforts by federal and state governments, local governments, um, local organizations, um, all kinds of people actually, you know, really working hard to make sure that there were food programs in areas reaching out to the people in need. And many of those included really, really creative ways to make sure, especially like kids who were out of school, got their food. So it is absolutely a continuing problem to make sure that we have nutritious and healthy food. Um, and so I'm excited to hear everybody talking about all these different programs to make sure that our communities have that and we have the knowledge for what we need. I will start off with Brett Peterson to hear about um, our what is going on in terms of the, the dietitian and what we need to be eating. Well, good afternoon, and thank you for having me as a, as a member of this panel. Um, I'm just going to go over some basic stuff as far as nutrition goes. Um, a lot of people like to make it more difficult than it is. You don't need to be on any specific diet per se or get into a, a program that you have to pay extra. A lot of people think they have to take vitamins and minerals to meet their needs. Variety, what they say is a spice of life, a spice of life, and it is. Eating a variety is the goal. So you get on a diet, and let's say it's a, a diet that takes out a macronutrition. Nutrient. And what I mean by macro, either a carbohydrate, protein, fat, a lot of times it's the carbohydrate that they try to eliminate or decrease so much that you're not going to get that variety to meet all your needs. So eating a variety is it, balance. So don't stick to one food group or try to minimize a food group so much that you're not going to meet your needs in vitamins and minerals. So eating a variety, look at a plate and take roughly about a 10 inch plate. On that plate, a quarter of the plate should be your protein. And that protein can range, meaning that you don't always have to have meat. If you look at plant-based proteins, such as canned beans, are very cheap. And you can do a lot with them. They go a long way. They can store easily. They can last a long time. It's a good protein source. And then you look at the other part of that, and you say your dairy, or I mean your starch. And you want to go for whole grains. And what I mean by whole grains is that it's not processed. And you think of a whole grain being where you're gonna get your fiber. Most Americans, we don't get enough fiber. So those beans would be a good source of fiber. Whole grains being from your cereals, your pastas would be a great source of fiber, your breads. And you wanna look at at least four grams of fiber per serving. Then you look at another quarter of that plate, that should be your fruits. And the other quarter should be your vegetables. So there's your variety. That's what a plate should look like, about a 10 inch plate to get your variety. Fruits can be fresh, or as we live in the UP, we know we don't have a lot of fresh fruits all, all season. So frozen um, are just as good as fresh, meaning that you're gonna have just as many vitamins and minerals in those frozen. And a nice thing about frozen vegetables, if you're making, or frozen fruits is if you're making um, like a fruit smoothie, you can use what you want, put it back in the freezer, clamp it, put it back in the freezer and have it for another time. Whereas if you buy fresh, as you know, if you don't use it within a week, it probably will go bad or within two weeks if you're having it in the fridge. So, and then you look at vegetables, again, fresh vegetables up in the UP, hard. Um, but in the winter, frozen vegetables are just fine. And actually, if you look at cost, fresh vegetables, especially if it's not that time of season, um, especially right now, they are fine. But frozen vegetables are just fine. As far as vitamins and minerals make up, they are fine. Canned vegetables, canned fruits, if you're getting canned fruits, Make sure that you get it in its in water, in its own juices. Um, so you don't want anything added with syrup or if they're going to add fructose to it or anything like that. Just get it, read the label, you look for a clean label. And then vegetables, a lot of your canned vegetables, if they're, in a, if they're canned, they're going to have sodium added. So you get the no added sodium vegetables. Um, you can always add herbs and um, spices to it if you want to uh, spice it up a little bit or make it taste a little different. So those are good alternatives besides the fresh. So eating a variety is the spice of life and it makes sure that you meet your needs as far as getting all those vitamins and minerals to make up, to have a healthy life, to get enough energy to go through it. 
And like I said about meats, you don't have to have per meat. You can have plant-based proteins, which are just as good as animal-based proteins, but you'd need to eat a variety of those plant-based proteins. They don't all have a nine essential amino acids. And those nine essential amino acids, meaning that you have to get them from your diet. Your body doesn't make them. Um, just some other things is healthy diet is try not to eat out as much, meaning that when you go out to a restaurant, it's going to be more expensive. Another thing to look at is if you compared what you would pay at home for a meal compared to what you pay in a restaurant, usually it's half or a quarter, meaning that what you pay, you pay 25 cents per serving, let's say at home, you're going to at least pay a buck or a buck more per serving just on a whole, if you look at just the big picture of it. And then you look at portion. What we call it is portion distortion. If you go out to eat and they actually follow portions, you would think, I'm not making, I'm, this isn't worth my money. They always are going to have bigger portions and they usually have bigger portions in your starch. So if you go to a fast food, your French fries are huge. It's cheap. But all those extra calories, they're not good. So what we call is portion distortion. That's one way to avoid that is make meals at home, try to eat at home more often. Today's American lifestyle, and I just look at when I was a kid, I lived in Marquette. And if you went from Marquette to Ishpeming, you would maybe pass five fast food restaurants. Does anybody know how many fast food restaurants you'd pass from Ishpeming to Marquette now? It's over 30. It's crazy. So the temptation is always there. Just a couple of tidbits to help with that is always have a healthy snack in your car, meaning like peanuts, maybe some carrot sticks, something to tide you over. Nuts are a great source. They stay, they last long. You don't have to refrigerate them. They're healthy in fiber. They're a good protein source and they're a good fat source, meaning that omega-3s are in there, a healthy fat. But what it does is it doesn't allow you or it helps you Avoid those fast foods because if you're hungry, a lot of people just be, I'm hungry, boom, they pull into a fast food restaurant. Or let's say you go to Menards to buy a two by four, whatever you're building. You get in line at a Menards, they're not the same as, or at a Ace Brew Value, all the hardware stores, they have food in them now. So you can buy a two by four, a gallon of milk and a candy bar. Whereas back in the day, you couldn't do that. So the food, the temptation to buy those extra snacks are always around. That's why having something healthy in your car to help ease that a little always works. So trying to ease those temptations are a good way to do it. Um, another big thing, too, as far as eating a balanced meal and trying to control those hunger things is water. People that are a little high dehydrated, it acts as almost like you're hungry. So you get kind of confused in that. And you think, well, I'm hungry. If you have a water bottle with you throughout the day and drinking water throughout the day, We'll ease that. So having a water bottle with you all day is a great thing. Have it at your desk, et cetera. Um, grocery shopping, another way. When you go grocery shopping, don't go hungry. What happens when you go hungry? You buy everything. So try to eat something before you go grocery shopping. Again, if you have those healthy snacks in your car, eat that before you go grocery shopping. You'll make better choices. And another thing about the healthy snacks in your car, how many times have you got home and if there's something on the counter and it's usually cookies, bags of chips, if you're hungry, you know what you're going to do? You're going to eat them. Then you're going to eat, you know, then you're going to try to make dinner. But you're eating those healthy things because of those unhealthy things on the counter. They're usually not healthy, like bags of chips or something like that. And those eating not the healthy snack prior to getting in there, you just make bad choices. So trying to set your up prepare <clears throat> or trying to set it up Set yourself up not for failure. And then lastly, plan. So in the morning, a lot of people, a lot of my patients that I get, it's breakfast is the big one that they, they usually miss. If you plan ahead, plan for the morning, plan for your lunch, you'll make better choices. Um, if you go to work and you didn't plan for lunch, you're usually going to go out or going to get what everybody else has ordered, and it's usually not the most healthiest. So planning ahead always works too. So, Britt, you mentioned a couple things uh, when you talked about the label. Uh, you talked a little bit about um, fiber, yep. um, and um, you also talked about sodium. And is there anything else that people should be paying attention to on the food label itself when it comes to wanting to know if they're eating something that's nutritious? The one thing you look at first on a food label is the portion size. So you know what? A lot of times, you know, if you buy a bottle of juice, for example. Juice, the serving size is four ounce. 
you get a 20 ounce bottle of juice, that's five servings right there. So just pay attention. A lot of times they'll have the serving size as the bottle. So if you know four ounces is a serving size, you know, you're not, if you drink the whole bottle, you're going to get roughly about 200 calories right there. So serving size is number one. And then you look at things like, you know, percentage of fat. Saturated fat is the big one in trans fat. Trans fat, we should avoid as much as possible. The saturated fat, if it's less than two grams, that would be a good choice. Um, on the whole, as far as fat, less than 20% on that package would be a good choice. And then you look at sodium. Sodium should be a low sodium um, item would be less than 140 grams of sodium per serving. And you look at fiber, anything more than four grams of fiber would be considered a high fiber um, item. So those would be things that you'd look at quickly. So you also talked a little bit about planning ahead. Um, and I, I have a bad time with that sometimes. Like I, I'll think, oh, I should do this the night before. And then I think, no, nah, I'll just do it in the morning. And then in the morning I'm like, no, nah, I'll just, I gotta go. <laughs> so um, I think that's a really good tip for a lot of people to try to plan ahead for some of that uh, meal preparation and what you're gonna do for the day. Um, can you talk a little bit about nutritional value and popular diets? So you, uh, some people think to eat healthy, they have to follow a certain diet. And that's what I was getting at at first was the variety. Eating a variety of foods is the best thing. Um, a lot of these diets that are popular, um, it's, a, it's, it's not only that they're going to make money on it, which is another side effect, but some of them are healthy. But then you have to buy their product or they want you to buy their product. So they kind of set it up around that. And I, I tell my clients is try to not make it so difficult. We all have to eat. And like I said, a variety is the best way. And look at your portions. That is the easiest and the best and the most, um, you know, as far as cost effective way to make sure that you're meeting your needs. Don't rely on a vitamin. Don't rely on, on, on a certain diet. Try to eat a good variety. And by, by doing that, and then you look at, you know, is there cheaper ways to eat healthy? There are. You know, we talked about the frozen foods. We talked about canned. Um, going with plant-based proteins, not all the time, but, you know, replacing a meal a couple times a week with a plant-based meal is much cheaper than, than meat. If you look at like a pound of hamburger compared to a can of beans, I mean, it, it's a lot cheaper for the can of beans and you can do, like I said, wonders with a can of beans. So looking at that um, is a healthy way to eat and don't buy into these diets per se, because if you look at how many different diets come out in a year, in 10 years, in 20 years, it, it's, it's blows you away. And like I said, too, is if they're, they're trying to take out a macronutrient or decrease it so much, I always think of it by decreasing that macronutrient, like carbohydrates down to 10%, you're taking away a lot of your variety, thus taking away a lot of your vitamins and minerals. Great. Thank you, Brett. Um, if anybody's just now tuning in, this is the UP Community Health Town Hall program, and tonight's topic is nutrition and food security uh, in the Upper Peninsula. Um, we have a number of expert panelists here. Um, if you're watching on Zoom right now, please feel free to submit any kind of questions in the Q&A, and we will take a look at what pops up and make sure that we can ask that to our panelists. Those of you who might be listening on the radio, please feel free to submit your questions at ruralhealth at nmu.edu, and we'll keep an eye on emails for those as well. Uh, next, we have Joseph Jones. Uh, he's joining us tonight from Lower Michigan uh, and Feeding America West Michigan, and he's going to talk a little bit about uh, food insecurity and what Feeding America West Michigan is doing right now um, to help the Upper Peninsula. Thank you, Joseph. Thank you, Elise. Um, so here at Feeding America West Michigan, we are the we are one of seven uh, food banks that uh, co coordinate together across the state of Michigan. Um, our food bank has 40 counties in the state of Michigan, so the west half of the lower peninsula and all 15 counties of the upper peninsula. Um, <clears throat> and a food bank is different than a food pantry in that a food bank is the one that's going out um, sourcing food through farmers, manufacturers, retail organizations, you know, kind of other food sources, um, aggregating that food together and then distributing it out to food pantries who are the ones that are handing out to groups of people. Our two major 
kind of uh, areas in which we're moving food is through the food pantry system. Um, so your St. Vincent de Paul's, your Salvation Armies, um, various other kind of church-based pantries that you might be familiar with in your communities. Um, they're, we're one of the sources of food for them. Um, <clears throat> And the other way in which we are distributing food predominantly is through the mobile food pantry program. Um, and that is where we're sending uh, semi truck loads of food uh, up to the Upper Peninsula. That food is predominantly uh, perishable food. Um, and so this is not any kind of competition with the local uh, pantries. This is meant to supplement what they're able to offer, which is oftentimes much more shelf stable. Uh, but kind of getting to the point that Brett was making in order to make a good, well-rounded diet, you know, it's good to be able to have some fresh fruits and vegetables, to be able to have uh, dairy products, be able to have, um, you know, uh, good lean meats. And so about 80% of the food on those distributions in the Upper Peninsula are those types of products. Um, there are some other products on there as well, you know, um, bakery items and and sometimes uh, more shelf stable products, uh, bags of bags of beans and things of that sort. So that's um, kind of the two ways in which we distribute food. Um, those programs are again across the Upper Peninsula. Um, we're expanding some of those uh, activities in the western part of the Upper Peninsula here this year, um, and really trying to integrate that work. Um, earlier, Kelly was talking about. Um, kind of food insecurity and food insecurity figures. Um, there's really two um, studies that look at food insecurity across the, uh, across the country. One is done by the U USDA uh, Economic Research Service. That one's a um, kind of a sampling um, um, variety of study that is based upon uh, questions related to food insecurity that are asked every December um, when, a, when a major um, census study is done. Um, the other one is through Feeding America, the national office in Chicago. They do a study that they call Map the Meal Gap. That one is based upon uh, statistical modeling based on census data. It's looking at poverty, um, employment, home ownership and disability as indicating factors for food insecurity. Um, employment and disability tend to be the ones that have the most dominant relationship. So a lot of people think of the food insecure as the people who are poor. Um, while that isn't untrue, there's a lot of people who are you know, facing food insecurity who also are facing poverty. Most often what it's really mostly tied to has to do with stable employment. Um, so people who lapse in and out of employment situations kind of waver in and out of food insecurity. Another kind of myth around food insecurity is, is that it's kind of, it's the same group of people all the time. Um, the studies from the USDA suggest that it's um, uh, the, a, a kind of a bout of food insecurity generally will last about seven months and the actual food insecurity is about seven days of those months. So people aren't food insecure all the time. And a lot of people kind of cycle in and out of food insecurity as they gain a foothold of, of more stable financial situations. But it doesn't take much, you know, a um, job loss, uh, a health problem, um, you know, a transportation issue, anything that can disrupt their work environment or increase the demands on their household budgets can kind of push people towards food insecurity. Uh, this became a lot more widely understood during the pandemic when people through no fault of their own uh, might not be able to work for a while. Um, when, when they were faced with that type of situation, uh, that put them in a condition where they um, might have faced some food insecurity right initially in the pandemic. Uh, but as Kelly mentioned, uh, the response during that time kind of helped to mediate that within about three months in the state of Michigan. Um, now that I've kind of talked about that, um, I'll throw a few numbers at you. Hopefully it's not too painful. Um, in the Upper Peninsula, um, the poverty rate's running about 13%. Um, disability for people under the age of 65 is at 11, 11.5%. 11 um, the food insecurity rate is 14%. And maybe an easier way to think of that is one in seven 
um, people in the Upper Peninsula are facing food insecurity. Among children, it's slightly higher. It's 14.2%. Um, by comparison, um, the state of Michigan's figure is, is about 11.5%. So you can see where that goes. Um, food insecurity rose pretty dramatically with the Great Recession, which I don't think is a surprise to anyone. Um, it's, it seemed to peak in about 2011. Um, was coming down for years after that. And then an interesting thing happened about 2017. The trends started to split. Um, so food insecurity continued to decline in urban areas, but then it started to rise again in rural places, including in the Upper Peninsula. And so those rates started to go back up since 2017. Uh, the pandemic caused it to spike for a short period of time in 2020, uh, but kind of as it returned to quote unquote normal, um, it still shows that kind of slow and steady rise. Um, with the food inflation we've had in the last uh, year plus now, uh, that's having an impact. And then the end of uh, emergency SNAP benefits seems to be adding to that issue. Um, so, um, um, what else would you like to talk about, Elise? You know me, I'll talk about anything. Um, I just have a quick question for you, and then I think Kelly might have a few questions. But um, I wanted to ask you, uh, one of the things that you had a stat out there, and I don't want to misquote it, but it was something along the lines of uh, the people who come to the mobile food pantries qualify for SNAP benefits. And what percentage... Uh, actually qualify versus those who are actually receiving? Okay, it, based on our studies, uh, we did a study of mobile food pantries across our service area in 2021. And the study suggested that 77% of the households that were coming were eligible for SNAP benefits. Um, you know, the, that runs at about 200% of the poverty line in the state of Michigan. About 77% were eligible and only 27% were actually enrolled in receiving SNAP benefits at the time. I've, you know, there aren't any good um, published data on what the expected enrollment in SNAP should look like. But from my um, cursory study of comparing kind of food insecurity rates to enrollment rates in the Upper Peninsula suggests that the Upper Peninsula lags behind the rest of the state in terms of SNAP enrollment. And I would love to challenge our region to try to increase that number, you know, and, and if the best way is to reach people where they are, you know, when they're coming for mobile food pantries, I would love to, you know, be able to coordinate some of that across the region if that's a possibility this summer. Um, Joseph, Kelly has some questions for you. I do want to back up for just one moment. Uh, Brett, we had a question that had also come in that I don't want to forget to ask you. Um, the question was about intermittent fasting as a lifestyle and uh, indicating that that can also save money. There's some mixed results on intermittent fasting, um, and it's not for everyone. It really isn't, um, especially like a diabetic or something. So intermittent fasting, um, you know, you think back to when we were first on this planet, did we have intermittent fasting? Yes. We, we, if food wasn't available, we had that. Um, as far as overall health, like I said, there's some mixed studies that there does show to be there's people that can lose weight. Um, lipid levels go down, their labs improve, um, mood improves, a lot of things. Then there's other studies that show that, no, they lack energy, fatigue, those types of things. Um, and, you know, lean body mass, all those things are muscle. So there's some mixed studies on there. I wouldn't say it's, it's for everybody. Um, you know, I'm a big believer in as long as you're meeting your needs, you're healthy, your labs are looking good, you have energy, um, if it works for you and you find that that's the best way for you to be healthy, I'm for it. But again, it's not for everybody. And the variability of fasting is it varies, meaning that some people will fast from seven o'clock at night till seven in the morning. Others will fast from seven o'clock at night till four o'clock and then eat for three hours and then fast the whole time. So it's just a lot of variety on, on, on the definition of what is actually considered fasting. So the book's out on it. Like I said, for some people, it does work. Um, I'm kind of still on the 
teeter teeter totting on it. For some, it works. For some, it, it doesn't work. So, thank you, Brett. Yeah. All right. So I have a question for Joseph. So thinking about you mentioned that um, you guys are bringing up some fresh produce, and which is wonderful to hear um, because, like you said, that many people who are in need of of having a little bit of support um, at various different times, the types of foods that that are shelf stable are you know, and in some cases can be that ultra processed food, which isn't exactly um, the best options for um, for someone, especially if they have some other illnesses. But along those lines, so during the during the pandemic, many of us built or learned how to garden and, and some were more successful than others. <laughs> some years better than others, I can say for our garden personally. Um, but is there a way if we have an overproduction? Um, I know our neighbors at one point were running away when we had so many tomatoes all over the place. Um, is there a way to be able to donate if you, perhaps if you fish and you have excess fish or you hunt um, or you garden that you can share your produce through Feeding America or other food pantries? Uh, we strongly encourage people to be involved with the, their local pantries. Um, you know, this is not, you know, we work in partnership with them. It's not a competition. And so oftentimes they're the best way to kind of move this product quickly. You know, when you're picking your ripe tomatoes in August and early September, you know, it's a, it's a great time to kind of share that, that bounty with your neighbors in need. Um, most of the pantries that I know of are just thrilled when they receive phone calls about, you know, fresh produce, um, game items, you know, things of this sort. So, you know, I would encourage you to kind of get in contact with your local pantry. Um, speaking to that vein, um, I'm going to plug our website, uh, which is feed, F-E-E-D-W-M, like West Michigan, Dot org. If you go to that website, in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see kind of two buttons that might be helpful for you. Uh, some of you might choose to click on the donate button. I won't stop you. Um, others of you might want to look at the find food uh, button. That um, can help uh, provide resources and identify who your uh, local pantries might be. It identifies mobile food pantries that are coming up in the next 30 days. And that's always a rolling calendar. So you can always look ahead at what's happening. That can be searched by county. It can be searched by zip code and kind of provide you with what's in your immediate area. There's a map itself that you can kind of zoom in on. Um, we're expanding kind of some of the details of what's available um, on that map as well. Um, so that might be a resource to help people if they're unfamiliar with who their local pantries are. Great. So one more question on your website. So there is something called Recipes for Success on there. Can you explain more about that program? Yes, that is a coordinated effort that we're doing with the UP Food Exchange and the Northern Michigan University Center for Rural Health, um, which is one of the ways in which I know Elise. And what that program is, is it's really meant to be something to a, an event kind of paired with our mobile food pantries. It doesn't happen every time. We often, we've, we've been doing it during the summer last year. We're looking to, to kind of grow on that this year. And it's where we have some uh, local individuals with some nutritional experience, identify some of the products that are coming on that particular distribution, prepare a sample of or two of a good healthy food a recipe um, that can be shared with people in their vehicles, engage with them, talk about what's going on in, in, in their communities, in their lives, um, share information about um, SNAP and other resources that might be available. Um, there's a lot of good recipes. I'm going to go back and plug Elisa's website there with the, with the Center for Rural Health. You know, there's a lot of good recipes there. There's video demonstrations. Um, and we're looking to kind of share other resources because we understand that, you know, lots of people know what to, you know, one or two or three things maybe to do with a head of cabbage. But, you know, if you've got a head of cabbage, maybe you want to try something new or something else. And so, you know, for some of these products or things that might be a little less familiar to folks to give them some different ideas, different recipes. And we really tried to maximize them both for nutritional quality and taste, but also for, you know, people who are on a, a tight budget so that there's not a whole lot of extra ingredients. And so it's not like you're spending a lot of money to be able to make the recipe. 
Great. So, Thank you very much. Oh. We we also had a question that came up in the um the Q and A section um from some of our Zoom listeners and watchers. Um the question was the types of programs that might best impact food insecurity in the UP. Um do we need additional food pantries, mobile pantries, funding? Um, is it one particular thing or perhaps a combination of factors? Um, and some of the things that might be striking our area, of course, that were in these questions talked about geographic issues, financial, regulatory, cost of food. Um, are all those things impacting uh, what's happening in the UP for food security? I think they are. And there's kind of a bit of a coordination of those items. Um, you know, the, you know, the food pantries, the mobile food pantries, you know, there are programs for children, you know, some backpack programs related to schools, you know, there's programs that are working through libraries, there's programs that are connected to residential homes, senior specific programs, meal sites, you know, these are meant to work in tandem with one another to kind of provide the support that any particular individual in a community might need. Uh, that being said, you know, there's a lot of the challenges that the Upper Peninsula is facing related to food insecurity are things that are facing the country as a whole. Um, you know, the availability of food in the food system has been disrupted by the pandemic, um, and those issues kind of continue. And everybody's seen the stories that have been coming out of uh, from all over the country, whether it's wildfires or the flooding in California, things like this, that a lot of those are causing disruptions in what food is available. That's presented us a lot of challenges in terms of being able to source food. Um, I would, I think that the um, network of 199 uh, Feeding America food banks across the country, I think we're in unison when we say that this has probably been the most challenging food sourcing era that we've ever faced. So we're having to do more to purchase food. There's less donated items. There's less uh, food coming in through the federal government. And so because of that, you know, there's a lot of challenges being faced there. And, you know, again, with the Upper Peninsula being kind of the end of the line for food distribution um, for retailers and such, you know, that, that just heightens the challenges related to the Upper Peninsula. Great, thanks. Um, we're gonna move on to our next speaker who is Jolene Spencer, a public health nurse coordinator. And I would just like to say to both of our next two speakers, happy National Public Health Week next week. <laughs> Thank you. Um, like she said, I work with WIC in Marquette County. Um, WIC is Women, Infants and Children, and it's a supplemental food and nutrition program that's run, it's funded through the USDA at a federal level, and then it's administered through the state health departments and um, run through local agencies. Across the UP, it's mostly run, it is not mostly, it is run through all of our local health departments. So if you're not in Marquette County and you wanted to find out more about WIC, you would just need to call your local health department and they can get you set up with, with someone from the WIC office there. We work with pregnant and postpartum people infants, both breastfeeding babies and formula fed babies and children up until the age of five. Um, to be eligible for WIC, they need to be in one of those um, age categories or circumstance categories. And then they either need to income qualify or they need to qualify for other services like Medicaid, SNAP benefits, or cash assistance. Participating in one of those three programs makes them automatically eligible for WIC. If people are qualifying based on income, we go at 185% of the federal poverty level. So for a family of four, that would be roughly 51,000 a year. Um, and we do count the unborn baby as a family member. WIC has been around since the 1970s. It was initially intended to help with malnutrition in pregnancy and early childhood, um, particularly with childhood anemia and inadequate growth. And WIC was found to help with both of those things and has also been found over the years to help with a number of other health outcomes, such as decreasing the risk of preterm birth, increasing early access to prenatal care, improving access to immunizations and health care for children, and um, decreasing the amount of babies that are born at low birth weight. 
WIC is also financially responsible um, for every dollar spent by WIC, more than $3 in subsequent healthcare dollars are saved. So it's really kind of good bang for our buck. And it um, helps with, you know, early childhood development and brain development at those young ages. Um, in Market County, we have roughly a thousand clients receiving WIC at any given time. And we do know based on Medicaid reports that not everybody who's eligible for WIC is participating. Um, sometimes that's by choice. Families feel they're getting by fine without needing our services. Um, other families just don't know that they're eligible. Um, so we do a lot of outreach around, around it, especially with clients who are getting other services. Um, and we always encourage people if they're interested in WIC and they're not sure to, if they qualify or not, just give us a call. Um, we're happy to talk to you and let you know if you're eligible. And if you're not eligible, we're usually able to help steer you in directions of other programs that you might find beneficial and might be eligible for. Um, the WIC program, like I said, is supplemental foods. Um, we provide our clients with a debit card and they're able to go to the grocery store and purchase eligible food items. And those are things like milk, eggs, peanut butter, or beans, we give dollars for fruit and veggies, um, cereal, and the food package is really designed to help them meet their nutritional needs, especially for the nutrients, iron, calcium, folic acid, and vitamin C. Um, we also provide nutrition education. Some of that is general information, like information on basic infant feeding, toddler feeding. We do a lot of talking with parents around picky eating. Um, that's a really popular question we get is my toddler preschooler is super picky. They'll only eat green foods this week or only eat white foods or will only eat chicken nuggets or things like that. Um, so we do a lot of nutrition counseling around those kinds of questions. And then also with pregnancy and postpartum nutrition and breastfeeding nutrition. We have a dietitian who works with us as well. And she does all of the same basic general education that I'm able to provide but she's also able to provide dietitian services to our clients. So she's able to work at a higher level with them for anybody who has specific medical conditions that affect their nutrition status, or like with children who maybe have a feeding tube or are having failure to thrive. Um, she's able to work with them and works very closely with their physicians and sometimes with outside dietitians if they're working with another dietitian from like University of Michigan, for example, she'll, she'll help coordinate services to make sure their WIC package is able to provide the specialty formula or whatnot that they need. We also provide referrals to, to other healthcare and community resources. So we're always trying to find out other programs that our clients might be able to utilize. And we like to share that information with them. And then a big part of WIC now too, is breastfeeding promotion and support. We have an entire program basically designed around breastfeeding. We have a lactation consultant and two peer counselors who work in that program and they do breastfeeding promotion and um, support visits with clients. And they're available by phone, they're available by text, and they can do in-person visits as well. Um, everyone in the community is eligible for our breastfeeding services, whether they're eligible for WIC or not. We have breastfeeding classes that we offer and a mom's group that we offer. Um, and those are designed, our classes are um, breastfeeding class and then a pumping class. And those are designed to help moms kind of get off to a good start with breastfeeding and kind of attack all of the typical myths and questions we hear around breastfeeding and answer questions. And then the pumping class helps with moms who are going back to work or school who might need to be pumping while they're away from their baby. And we help them navigate kind of things that come up with that. Our moms groups are right now just run virtually. We're hoping to get them back in person soon. Um, but it's a good place for moms to come if they just have some questions or want to connect with other moms who have babies of similar age. And then our lactation consultant is also available for one-on-one -on -one issues. Um, she's able to see people for private appointments and she can assess the situation and help them come up with a plan to work through whatever situation they're facing regarding breastfeeding. Um, thank, August thank is, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jolene, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I was just gonna say August is breastfeeding month and we always have some sort of event coming up. So watch for information on that. 
Thank you. I wish we had two hours for this because there's so much to talk about. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm going to move us through Susan and Gary to make sure they both get a few more minutes in. And um, if we have time, we'll take more questions toward the end of the program. Uh, you're listening to the UP Community Health Town Hall program. And tonight's episode is on nutrition and food security. And Susan, um, we'd love to hear from you next. Hi everyone, I'm Sue Kelby and I work at the Western UP Health Department as a case coordinator. Um, I'm here tonight to share with you how SNAP or the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program is the nation's most important and effective anti-hunger program. SNAP in Michigan is often known by other names such as food stamps or FAP. FAP, the Food Assistance Program. And if you're applying for food stamps at, through the application at MDHHS, you will see that there's a page and it's called FAP when you're applying for that as well as your health insurance and other benefits that they have available to help support people who are um, needing some support at certain times in their life as Joseph mentioned. Um, Last year, SNAP helped 1,349,000 Michigan residents or 13% of the population. And as Joseph said, that's one in seven people. That's how many people were supported last year. 61% of the people of SNAP participants are families with children. 41% are families with older adults or are disabled. 39% are in working families. So you might wonder like, who is eligible for food stamps or am I eligible for food stamps? And you might take a look at that. Um, eligibility is based on the financial situation of the members of the household, of all the fam members of the household. And so that's like a family unit, but also in some of our homes, the family unit is somewhat different, or there might be many people who are living, several people living in a home that are not related. And they too are considered a household group. And they would look at all of those individuals as, as well, unless they are not sharing, preparing, and have their food like in a separate refrigerator or something such as that. So, um, so there's two ways to look at families. Um, if you purchase food and prepare it together, that means you're a household group. So to determine what benefits you will be eligible for, MDHHS will review your expenses, your assets, your income, and your residency. And some examples of that are, for expenses are like your shelter. Do you rent? Do you have a mortgage? Your utilities, your heat, electric, and telephone. And then they might take into consideration any court ordered payments like child support. Also, they will look at your medical expenses. Do you have medical or dental um, bills? Do you have hospitalization, nursing care, medical supplies, health insurance premiums for like senior citizens? So, then they'll also take a look at your assets. Of course, they're gonna look at your assets, right? They're gonna look at how much money you have on hand, your checking and savings. Um, some people have trusts that might, that might you know, be included that they will wanna take a look at and your property or real estate, but they don't look at your first home, the home you're living in, that is exempt from that. And then they take a look at your income. What are your wages? Are you self-employed? Do you have rental income? Do you have social security benefits or veteran benefits? And then the last one, there is residency. So you have to live in Michigan. You have to be living in Michigan now and you must be a US citizen or an acceptable, have an acceptable alien status. And you might wonder how you can apply for, for food assistance. You can apply online at um, MyBridges, that's my is Michigan, M-I Bridges, 
at michigan.gov or by calling a number 188-642-7434. And if you prefer a paper application, one can be picked up at your local DHS office. Or if you call there at any one of our local offices, which you can check, you can Google or check their website, they will mail one for you. And once you are accepted, your food benefits include um, several things like staples would be fruits and vegetables, meat, poultry and fish, dairy products, and breads and cereals. They also allow some dessert items like snack items like crackers and muffins, cake, maybe fudge, um, even candy bars, ice cream. And um, they also will take um, foods that will complement your main ingredients. And that is seasonings, mustard and ketchup, all those kind of things, baking uh, supplies such as baking soda and vanilla, though so all of those. And they also, because drinks complement meals, they'll allow you to have soda pop, iced tea, and um, milk and juices. You're allowed to buy those on your, on your, um, on your EBT or your, um, your benefit card, your benefit, um, um, your, it's just a, it's just exactly like Jolene said, it's just a card, it's a debit card and, and you can take that, you can take that anywhere. You can go, because it's a federally, fu federally funded program, you could go and visit someone in Wisconsin and you could use your bridge card. That's not true, I don't think with WEC, but it is true for, um, for the EV for our Michigan card. So what you can't buy is alcohol, tobacco, vitamins, live animals, mm, prepared foods, and non-food household items. So, um, so like hygiene um, products, you cannot buy that. SNAP benefits are accepted at grocery stores and supermarkets, even some specialty stores, your farmer's market, and local co-ops, and some convenience stores accept them, and pharmacies like um, Walgreens do, um, gas stations, some gas stations do because they have food. But all your big stores like Walmart, Target, Myers, all these, and Whole Foods, you can even use your card to order that food online. And um, it works just like you're at the store and you can do a pickup or have it delivered in some cities. Now I wanted to talk about a little bit about um, our food benefits. Um, Susan, I do wanna interject. We've got about one more minute and then we're gonna have to move on to Gary. So make sure you also indicate where people can find out more information, please. Okay, so if you if you want to um, um, like apply for food assistance, you can start by calling your local your local um, your local MDHHS office, and they'll be happy to direct you. There's a website. All you have to do is is um, is type in mybridges.gov. And you can bring up that website and you can apply online. You can, you can call at 1-800 number that will be on there and you can call and somebody will, will help you through that process. Um, and um, so there's, there's, there's help out there. And if you do need help, you can reach out to your local health department. You can reach out to... Um, people like Salvation Army, your food pantries like like St. Vincent de Paul's, and there's so many people out there who are willing to help you and and um, and will help you advocate for you, secure those benefits. So um, just just if you have any questions, just feel free to call your local health department, and we will help you. Thank you, Sue. That was some great information, um, Gary. We've got about maybe four minutes, three and a half minutes. So um, let's have you talk a little bit about uh, the food is medicine program. Um, Gary, you're on mute. 
Well, thank you, Elise, and thank you, Kelly. Appreciate it tonight. DP Food as Medicine Collaborative started back in the fall of 2020. Um, the Michigan Health Endowment funded a feasibility study in partnership with Feeding America West Ishpeming, or West Michigan, <laughs> and Public Policy Associates to determine the need and interest. 54 agencies met monthly to discuss models and implementation in June of 2021, upcap in collaboration with 25 committed partners submitted paperwork. We got a uh, to Superior Health Foundation for their Food and Security Proactive Grant, and we were awarded that grant in uh, 2021. The primary goal is to address the improved food insecurity and for a low-income residents who currently have or are at risk of developing a chronic health condition. Um, this nutrition intervention utilizes a prescription for health model and covers all three regions of the UP. Grant uses a referral system with participating health providers. Uh, if you're interested, you can contact, contact your provider, fill out the referral form, sign a release form, the provider's fax. It's actually pretty simple. They fax everything to 211 at UPCAP, and 211 staff will contact you for further onboarding. Um, you can qualify those that qualify, they receive $300 worth of uh, fruits and vegetables for at $15 a week for 20 weeks. Each voucher is worth $5. And we mail vouchers out monthly, uh, and the vouchers expire at the October 31st of each year. Uh, there are opportunities to earn more uh, vouchers by attending educational events sponsored by the Prescription for Health team. You can earn an extra $50, so that would be $340. Uh, the program did include infrastructure development this year, which was cold food storage units. Uh, we through a grant process, we awarded nine grants this year, and we're going to award four more. So that it will be 13 to farmers to increase access to local nutritious food, increase capacity, and have an economic impact. Last year, we had 156 referrals, and of that, 100 enrolled and received $300. Reimbursed, we reimbursed $20,000 with a 67% redemption rate. This year, we already have 120 referrals and we haven't even started yet. So we have also expanding the program to other markets in the Upper Peninsula. In May of 2023, we're also piloting an emergency food transportation program. And if interested, you can go to our website at upcap.org. That's upcap.org, food as medicine. We are always updating uh, new providers to the program. Lastly, I'd like to just say the UP Food is Medicine Program success has been a large collaborative team effort and all of our partners, we are grateful for that. So thank you all for tonight, appreciate it. I would like to take a moment to thank you, Gary, for all the work that you've done on that program. Um, I know I was uh, on those calls in the very beginning and there's a lot of work that's gone into that. Um, I'd like to thank all of our panelists uh, this evening. Um, you know, Brett Peterson, uh, Joseph Jones, Jolene Spencer, Sue Kelpie, Gary Perilla, um, Kelly Cam, thank you for being panelists on our show this evening. And um, anybody that's interested in actually uh, watching this evening's episode, if you want to share that with anyone, it is available on our website, uh, nmu.edu slash rural health. And you can find all the recordings for the programs for this year on that program. And we hope you'll join us next month, the last Thursday of every month between 7 and 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you. Thank you.